So they were right on top of it, and we, they would brief us in, on the sand table, and it was accurate to the houses and the apple orchards and the roads. And uh, maybe two or three times a day we'd go into this tent and we were briefed. And when we came out, we would have to draw, to have, we'd give each one of us a stub of a pencil and a piece of paper, and we'd have to draw that map by uh, memory. So we were very well versed on the Normandy invasion, possibly more so than market garden or any, any other operation. And uh, we, were, we were studying that, plus the uh, aerial photographs. And at the same time, we had British troops who would roam in and out of our tents unannounced, and they were wearing German uniforms, and they never spoke to us. But well, you'd look up, and suddenly there's a, a Fallschirmjäger, or there's somebody else, you know, German infantry, and they're carrying weapons. But that was to familiarize us with who we were going to go up against, and, and if you did run into somebody that you had a confrontation with, if there's any information to come back, you could be accurate about it, say he was a tanker, or he was uh, SS, or Fallschirmjäger, or whatever. So we were pretty well informed, and then we got ready to go in, and we were supposed to take off on the night of uh, June the 4th, land on the night between June 4th to June 5th, the invasion coming in the morning of June 5th, and it was gale force winds, as John said. Uh, you could stick your arm out, and you couldn't see your hand for the downpour of rain, and still we were getting ready at our aircraft. We, we put on all of our weapons first, and then put on our parachutes over that, and uh, the rain was raining so hard that when we walked, the water would and take a step, the water would run out of the top of our paratrooper boots. It was, they were filled with water all the way down from the neck down. And finally, uh, uh, Jeep came by. I don't know how he found his way around, but he did. And he said the uh, jump had been postponed. It was not called off, it was postponed. So we went back to our tents. And we didn't even bother undressing. We just laid down soaked to the skin, soggy, laid on the canvas cots and without blankets, and we slept that night. Next morning we got up. The sun was shining bright. All the systems were go. We had to burn uh, any um, things that we couldn't take with us, letters or whatever. And we were required, I don't know how the other people did it, but we were required to write at least three to four letters each. And this has never come out that I know of in history. I, I don't know if I had it in my book or not. But we had to uh, post-date them. And then there, our company's uh, headquarters company who stayed behind would periodically mail these letters home. So that if, when the news broke that the invasion was there, then somebody back in the little neighborhood in Topeka, Kansas or something would say, well, that can't be my son's outfit because I just got a letter from him. So it was all pre-planned with very much forethought and precision. So the next day, June the 5th, we uh, got to our assigned planes. We put our uh, weapons on, carried our equipment, our, our uh, machine guns and things, and then we carried the, them in the leg bags. And we used to put them in a bag and throw them out of the plane and try to follow them. Uh, they had their own parachute. But the British came out with a leg back so, bag, so we started using those. And we could carry our mortars, machine guns, and all of our crew served weapons uh, in a leg bag. Of course, the men with the crew served weapons stood in the door first, and when they said go, he just stuck his leg out and he was gone. You have a 42 pound machine gun on it. But uh, we, did, we were, carried a lot of ammunition. The way this thing works, you can't expect a machine gunner to carry enough ammunition to sustain a, uh, a, a long firefight. And I know the infantry has trucks and different things of delivery uh, material, but we don't. When, when the paratrooper hits the ground and his feet, feet hits the ground, he's surrounded right now. Every paratrooper as an individual or as a group, he's surrounded. And there's no way in or out for uh, additional ammunition or supplies, food or whatever. So for the machine gunner, each man uh, say there's uh, probably 130, 150 men in a, in a company. So each man carried two boxes of machine gun ammunition. That would give each machine gun plenty of ammunition if, we, if they were split up and say 10 men got together, at least, at least they have 20 boxes of ammunition for the gun. And each man was required to carry two 60 millimeter mortar rounds and uh, say two bazooka rockets. We also carried a British type Hawkins mine tied to our left leg was uh, activated by uh, acid, 
if a person stepped on it, it would sustain a 200-pound man, but it was made for anti-vehicle. Uh, so you, uh, troop movements going ahead could step on the mine, it wouldn't bother them, but when the half-track or tank ran over, it would blow the track off. So we had a lot of ammunition and everything. In fact, I had just, I had just turned 19 and uh, a couple of months before, and I weighed 140 pounds, and I carried in 150 pounds of equipment, and that's including my parachutes. And when we put the chutes on, we were just like a turtle. We, uh, the Air Corps had men out there. They would lure us to the ground. One man would stand on our back. The other one would fasten a belly band. Then they would have to pick us up, walk us to the plane, shove us up in there. And when you landed on the floor of the plane, you were like a turtle on this par reserve parachute, and you just turned around, finally crawled across the floor to your seat and pull yourself up. So we uh, took off and turned, and I was in one of the lead planes of that takeoff, and we were the point of the spear. And we went up, it was just starting to get dark, and they have a British double savings time at that time, like we have, you know, the go an hour ahead, an hour behind, but I never did figure that out when the double double savings time. And, but it was still, it was getting close to midnight or 11 o'clock, and it was still daylight, it was just getting dark. And we went up and circled over England, and being the first ones up, we circled several times, and then I always explained it as like, being like a, uh, a comet with a long tail. And as we circled over England, the other planes were still lifting off from the runways, and they would join in behind. When we got long enough where all the serials were there, we swung out over the ocean, around the Continent Peninsula, and came over the uh, island, islands of Jersey and Guernsey. And I th remember that there were not supposed to have much armament or anti-aircraft on there, but when we came over those islands, we received a lot of it. There's uh, anti-aircraft artillery, which is AAA or AAA, machine gun fire, 40 millimeters, and everything was coming up. And about that time, this was the first time we had ever had a door on the plane. I don't know why they put it on this time, because when we went over those islands, they uh, Lieutenant Muir, who was from Bay City, Michigan, who was our platoon leader, ordered us to take the door off and store it in the after part of the plane, which we did. And um, we hit the mainland, and uh, flak was really coming in, and we ordered to stand up and hook up. That way, if the plane were hit and going down, we at least stood some chance of getting out of that plane. We have cleared 17 men in 11 seconds going out the plane. It's not like the movie where you see a man stand at the door and the guy says, go, and then the next one they talk a little bit. Now go, and you, and you go, well, my God, that plane's going 150 miles an hour. You're going to be a long distance apart with that. When we came out of there, we was like one big ball, everybody riding each other's back. The man in the door was holding back with his hands as hard as he could, his feet braced, and the guy from the cockpit forward, everybody was pushing, pushing. And close it up, close it up, and he kept pushing. And all of a sudden, uh, the, the jump master, like Lieutenant Muir, is watching the little light and the green light, red light, go, go, go. And we were, when, he, when the guy in the door released his hands, they were gone. The plane was empty. 11 seconds, they were gone. And that's, uh, that was 17 men with, uh, well, in, in uh, jumping into combat, we had, um, we had 17 men on the stick. You usually have 24 on practice. But with all the added equipment, and then the planes were so overloaded that they staggered when they took off. But we uh, we parachuted out, and all, when I looked out the plane uh, ports, all I could see was uh, anti-aircraft, uh, AAA, 40 millimeters, tracers, uh, 30 calibers, 50 caliber, everything was coming up. It looked like you could walk on the, on the tracers. The plane was bouncing around. We got hit several times. You could hear the bullets ticking through, but no, I was lucky no one in my plane was hit. We went out, and we were. Uh, what happened just prior to that? And I know it's written in one book that the that the pilots were not properly trained. They were properly trained because if they weren't trained and flying at night by instrument, where did we, uh, the paratroopers, get our training? We were in those planes when they were training, so we got our training. 